it up. Give it up for Hutch. It's a cool, rainy, fall Friday night. You're standing in line to buy a ticket for yourself and your date. After your ticket is bought, you step through the theater doors and up to the snack counter. There you buy a popcorn, milk duds, and your favorite beverage. You head into the theater. It's dark. There's a few people there, but you're there early. You settle into your seat, begin to enjoy what is about to take place, some light conversation, turn your phone off. Then onto the screen, 20 minutes of previews before the main attraction. And then finally, the screen tightens up just a little bit. The lights are dimmed even lower across the screen, the title, From Pit to Pinnacle, A True Story. The very first scene is of a little boy, maybe seven years of age, playing with some toys. He's obviously by himself, although there are others in the house, and then some commotion in the room right next door. And it's unmistakable that this commotion is a woman in great travail. The kind of travail a woman only experiences when giving birth to a child. With one loud scream, silence. The only thing that pierces the silence is the cry of a newborn baby boy followed immediately by the wailing of a husband and a father who has just lost his true love. The love of his life has given her life in giving life to a little boy. Fast forward, scene two. Ten years have passed. One night, this young man has a couple of dreams. Dreams seem to play a reoccurring theme in his story. He takes the content of those dreams and he eagerly, eagerly and excitedly shares them with his brothers, only they don't take them as he does. It only serves to fuel the anger against him that they already feel. Who do you think you are that we're going to bow down to you? Next scene. Dad tells him to go and check on his brothers. They're tending sheep in a distant land. Probably not the wisest decision, but his dad is certainly not known for all the wise decisions he made in his life. And so, he goes to find his brothers. Of course, he was wearing his very best bedazzled coat of many colors. And in the far off distance, his brothers recognize him, not because of his face, because he's too far to get a good view of his face, but they recognize that coat. They unmistakably knew exactly what that meant. Here comes that dreamer, they say to themselves. They huddle up and begin to discuss. Now is the opportunity. Let's kill him and get rid of him and see what becomes of his dreams. As that image gets closer and closer and closer, cooler heads prevail. And instead of killing him, they decide on an opportunity to put a little coin in their pocket. The next scene, their younger brother, stripped of his coat of many colors with a metal collar around his neck, chains around his hands and his feet, holding on to the bars of a mobile cell as it begins to pull away. And he sees everything that he has ever known 
and everything that he has ever loved fade in the distance as he is bewildered and wondering, what's happening? Why me? Why now? The next scene in this cinematic adventure We see this young man still with the metal collar around his neck and the chains on his hands and his feet. He's standing on a podium all by himself, no coat this time, wearing just a a simple piece of garment to cover his private area. There's great ruckus going on because, you see, this is a, a bidding war to see who will buy this young man as a slave. Finally, an official in the king's house pays the highest price. The collar is undone, the chains are let go, but he's still a slave, just in a different home. Watching this young man, his now owner is beside himself. He sees that everything that he touches seems to prosper. He almost has that Midas touch where where things grow, they develop, they mature, they they, they multiply, and he comes to understand this guy has something different about him. I'm not really sure what it is, but there's something so different, so unique about him. I'm going to raise him up to be in charge of all the other servants in my home. As a matter of fact, he will be the second most powerful person in, in his home. And then that first time, the seductress saddles up alongside of him and whispers sweet nothings in his ear. And he rebuffs her. And so begins a long torrent journey. Until finally one day, circumstances are such that no other servants are in the home. It's just her and him. And she says, come sleep with me. He says, no, I, I, I cannot do this. How could I do this great evil in the sight of my God? And so he, he swirls out of his robe, runs out into the street. She lets out a scream, holding his robe in her hand. The other servants are just outside. They come in. She says, he came in to rape me until I screamed, and he got scared, and he ran out. Her husband wasn't home at the time, but he came home shortly after. Obviously, a servant had gone and gotten him and said, Sir, you need to come home immediately. Something has has, has happened. He hears her story. And even though he was a husband who never paid quite as much attention to his wife as he ought to have, he burned with anger in his heart. And although he was the chief law enforcer in the king's service, he knew that perhaps maybe she had a little more to do with it than she led on to, for him to believe. The result, it's not beheading, it's prison. And now this 20-something-year-old young man finds himself in another pit, only this time the pit is actually a prison. The prison warden takes notice, and over time, he also begins to see what the former boss saw, that everything this guy touches prospers, everything turns to gold. And so he decides, I am going to take advantage of this, and I'm going to put him in charge of all the other prisoners, and that's exactly what he does. Then one day, in a bit of a fit of rage, the king sends his cupbearer and his baker to prison. We don't know why. Obviously, he's angry with them. And over a period of time, Joseph tends to them. And he notices after getting to know them that one day their countenance is down. And he asks them, why is your countenance down? And both of them said, a second time, we've both had a dream. The second set of dreams taking place in this young man's story. So he interprets the dream. And within three days, the dream becomes true. The cup pair is restored. The baker is hanged. The only request that this young man makes 
to the cupbearer is, remember me to the king when you get out so that I could get out of this prison because I am here falsely accused and I don't deserve to be. But as fate would have it in the next scene, two years have now passed. And a third set of dreams plays a vital role in this young man's story. This time, it's the king himself. He has two dreams. They bother him so. He calls all of his counselors in. He calls all of his advisors in. He tells them of his dream, but they are bewildered. They, they can't figure it out. And then all of a sudden, the cupbearer remembers his transgressions, and he says, there was a Hebrew when I was in prison, and, and, and it was the time when, when you put me and the, and the baker in prison, and we had a dream, and this Hebrew interpreted that dream. Well, get him. Get him here now. Get him here quickly. I need to know the answer to this dream. So they give him a shave and a bath and a clean robe. And as he comes into the king's presence, look at verse 41 of Genesis 41. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Why? Because Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream, dreams. And he said, well, what do I do next? And Joseph said, well, what you need to do is you need to find a man of great character, great ability. And you need to set him over all all of what's going on in Egypt because during the seven years of plenty, you're gonna to wanna to harvest everything that you possibly can and store it because there are seven years of famine coming immediately on its heels. Verse 41, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in the second chariot and they called out before him. Listen to what they said, bow the knee. After three sets of dreams, the first dream is now beginning to come to much more clarity. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift a hand or a foot in all the land of Egypt. And here's a young man now 30 years of age. And he's gone from a pit to a prison to a penthouse. From the pit to the pinnacle. And he's on top like he has never been on top before. Favorite son, check, did that. Lost my mom, lost my dad, lost my family, lost everything that I've known, but here I am with the ring on my finger. Royal clothes on my back, second in command, in the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. Let me give you four thoughts from this text about what to do when you're back on top. What to do when you're back on top. Number one, give praise to God for getting you out of your pit. Give praise to God for getting you out of your pit. Look at verse 16 of Genesis 41. Joseph answered Pharaoh. This is great. This is when Joseph is first called up out of prison. He stands before Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, I have some dreams I want you to interpret because I heard that you were really great at interpreting dreams. And look at what Joseph said. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not me. Did you hear that? He's away from all that he's ever known. He's been in a pit. He's been in a prison. Why not take a little bit of glory here? Because he was a man of character. He was a man of godly character. And he said, Pharaoh, you got to understand something. What's about to take place? What I'm about to tell you, it doesn't come from me. It's not about me. But praise God, it is about him. And God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Give praise to God. 
who brought you out of your pit. Number two, grant forgiveness to those who put you in your pit. Grant forgiveness to those who put you in your pit. Look at verse 40, uh, 51 of chapter 41. Joseph, to bring you up to speed at this particular point in this cinematic experience that we have before us today, has been not only given a ring and a robe, but he was given an Egyptian wife. And over a period of time, he is blessed with two sons. And the first son, look at what it says, verse 51. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all my hardship in all my father's house. Now understand something. This is a, a Hebrew way of speaking that we don't understand. He is not saying, I forgot all about my dad and I forgot all about my brothers. That's not what he's saying. We know that because he gave his son, born to him of an Egyptian wife, living in an Egyptian land, a Hebrew name. So he's not forgetting his past, but he is choosing to forgive. A better way to understand Manasseh is this. I let that stuff go. He forgave. He wasn't holding out a grudge, but he was extending forgiveness, even though his brothers didn't ask. Third thought, grow from your time spent in your pit. Grow from your time spent in your pit. Look at verse 52. The name of the second he called Ephraim. For God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. It would have been real, real, real easy for Joseph to have a pity party at the age of 17. Poor me. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I know that because they just sold me. I'm just going to go eat worms. But no. Remember the story? He rises in the ranks in Potiphar's house. He rises through the ranks in the prison. He rises through the ranks from prisoner to second chariot in the most powerful country on the face of the earth. Why? Because he learned lessons all along the way. You know what is worse in life than, be give, than, than not being given an opportunity. It's worse in life to be given an opportunity and not being prepared for it. Joseph was well prepared because he grew all the while he was in the pit. Number four, graciously help those who are in a pit of their own. Graciously help those who are in a pit of their own. Look at verse 57 of Genesis chapter 41. Moreover, all of the earth came to Egypt, to Joseph, to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all of the earth. Not only were the Egyptians eating good in the midst of a famine, but all those in the known world around Egypt had gotten word, even Joseph's dad. And he said to the boys, get yourselves down to Egypt as fast as you can because there is food in Egypt and that's what we need. And so Joseph takes his position and he extends a hand of help to those who are in the pit of famine. Those are some amazing lessons that you and I need to learn once we are put back up on top once again. 
Right now, we're going to break the tables. We're going to have some dynamic discussion. And in a few minutes, I'm going to come back, and I want to show you a thread that weaves through Genesis 41 that I think you will find absolutely amazing. just been looking at the cinematic experience of the life of Joseph. And now we come to the plot twist at the end. Genesis chapter 41 is really not about Joseph at all. So what in the world? We spent the whole time talking about Joseph, and it's not about Joseph at all. No, it's not about Joseph at all. Well, who is it about then? Well, let me give you a little bit of an explanation. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God made a promise in the middle of a curse against the serpent that involves the promise of a seed. As we turn the page from Genesis chapter three to Genesis chapter four, we see the very first murder where the seed of the serpent, Cain, kills the seed of the woman, Abel. At the end of Genesis chapter 4 and in the beginning verses of Genesis chapter 5, we see a genealogy. In this genealogy, we see that there are 10 generations from Adam to Noah. In the midst of this story and in the midst of this genealogy, we are introduced to a man by the name of Seth. Seth takes Abel's place, if you will, and carries God's promised seed in his lineage. As you know, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives are the only survivors of a cataclysmic worldwide flood. And that's important to remember because in the midst of that pronouncement of judgment, God saved a seed. Next thing you know, as we read through the scriptures, we run across a guy by the name of Terah. Terah is not a major player, but he gives birth to a guy we know very well by the name of Abraham. Abraham, of course, is also given many promises by God, the chief of which involves a seed, that he will have descendants as numerous as the grains of sand on all the beaches, on all the seashores of the earth. He will have descendants as numerous as the stars in the heavens. He's given this promise at age 75. God doesn't fulfill that promise immediately. As a matter of fact, we look back, and it's going to take a full 25 years, and so what do you do? Well, you take matters into your own hands, right? And Sarah, who is of great age, gives to Abraham her handmaiden. The result, a son is born. It is a son, Ishmael, but it is not the son, Isaac, the promised son. 
He comes 25 years later. Isaac grows up, gets married, has two boys, twins. Esau, the older, Jacob, the younger. It stands to reason that in the story and the way history seems to go, that the seed would flow through the older son, but their mom is given a vision of the future in which she is told that the older will serve the younger and the younger will be lord over the older. So she strategizes with Jacob of how to wrestle away the birthright and, and over a pot of bean stew, Esau gives up his birthright and then he goes in and he fools his dad and he gets the blessing. Esau is irate, as you can imagine. And he vows, the next time I see you, I'm going to kill you. So Jacob runs. Finally, he settles down enough, and out of the corner of his eye, he spots a beautiful woman. He introduces himself, and the next thing you know, he enters into a seven-year contract with her dad for her hand in marriage. At the end of seven years, having fulfilled his commitment, he gets a little tipsy. He goes into his marriage tent to consummate the marriage. And he wakes up in shock and horror the next day when he realizes that he has not been with the love of his life, Rachel. He has been duped and he has slept with Leah. Leah gives Jacob four sons. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. She gets to the point in her life where she can no longer bear him children, but in the old age of Rachel, God finally hears her prayer and gives her a son by the name of Joseph, and then secondly, a son named Benjamin. Have you ever noticed when we started our journey of Joseph, he shows up on the scene in Genesis 37, 17 years old. And then immediately in Genesis 38, Joseph doesn't appear in one single verse. Genesis 38 is all about Judah and his daughter-in-law Tamar and the worst day in Judah's life. A parenthetical pause in Joseph's story, but a very important parenthetical pause. Then in chapter 39, the story turns back to Joseph. But something interesting happens in Genesis chapter 43. Jacob has sent his sons down to Israel. They confront Joseph. They don't realize who he is. He says, tell me about your dad. And they tell him, he says, tell me about are all the brothers here? And they said, well, no, we've got one younger one back at home. He says, bring him to me. He says, we can't do that. It'll kill our dad if he comes. So Judah takes it upon himself to sell it to his dad. Listen, dad, I will stand in the gap for Benjamin. I will be his substitute. I will guarantee his return. Judah then has a great, 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 great grandson by the name of David. A young man who is anointed king but doesn't step into his role as king until years down the road. But there was a role that he played as he went to see his brothers on the battlefield, standing on one side, a valley in between the Philistines on another side. He heard the cursings of a giant named Goliath against his God. He said, I can't stand this anymore. And as a substitute, he goes down into the valley. He kills Goliath. He cuts off his head. And his story is that he ascends the throne. But David had a greater grandson. He is called the Lion of Judah. And his name is Jesus. And just like Judah, and just like David, Jesus stands in the stead as a substitute. 
not just for his family, not just for his people, but Jesus, as a substitute, gives his life on a cross to pay the sin debt of all of mankind down through time. Genesis 41 is not about Joseph. Genesis 41 is about God raising up Joseph to a point to where he could save his brother Judah. The promise through which the seed will flow to our Savior one day. That's what Genesis 41 is all about. It is a thread that weaves from Genesis 3 down to Jesus to you and me. What a beautiful picture. Who knows but what God is raising you up because of what he wants to do through you. Father, thank you for all that we have gained in our study of the life of Joseph. It is miraculous to see your handiwork at work preserving a promise made all the way back in Genesis chapter three. You raised up Joseph so that he could protect and save Judah, so that Judah could be raised up and Israel would be rescued. And eventually, as we see the line and lineage of our Savior, it leads down to each of us. I pray today that you would help us to see the great price that you have paid, the extensive length to which you have gone to make salvation available to each and every one of us. May we surrender to your word, to your will, and to your ways. And God, may you get all of the glory. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you back here next Friday. One Thing for Men meets at Cabernet Steakhouse in Alpharetta, Georgia on Friday mornings from 7 to 8 a.m. If you live in the Atlanta area or visit the area on Friday, we would love to have you join us in person. And if you have been blessed by this message, please consider supporting One Thing for Men online.